It is now almost three years since I learned of the events that I'm about to set down. More than 30 since they actually took place. Yet even now, I feel a certain reluctance to record them. To tell of a tragedy that should perhaps remain the secret of those who created it, rather than to be judged by strangers. Yet who better to tell that story than one who stood in the very room in which their tragedy occurred? Who better than one who became acutely aware of the terror of their experience? And who better than one that, to this day, to this very moment, feels some further manifestation of that terrible evil could still occur. The Mysterious Mansion by Honoré de Balzac Dramatised for radio by Peter Mackey Stop here, will you, Jean? Oh, there, steady now. Oh, easy, that's it, it's easy now. Beautiful. How is that, sir? A beautiful day. Beautiful river. I wouldn't know about that, sir. I come sure you must have swam here as a child. Well, that's a while back. And did you wonder from where this, this mass of water had come? Uh, no, sir. Can't say I did. But did you never wonder about the people and places these waters had touched on their journey? Nor of the great cities that lie far beyond this river's banks? Orléans, Dijon, Bordeaux. My father, he took me with him once to Blois. Must have been ten leagues or more. Away for three days we were. What did you think of the bridge there? Isn't it magnificent? Well, no, I, I don't really remember that. I was only a child, you see. Never been out of Vendôme before. But since? There was never the need. Well, I would dispute that. Sir? Uh, no. Perhaps you're right. Uh, but tomorrow, perhaps you'd care to show me the town of your childhood. Just as you like, sir. Only I doubt if there'd be much to interest you. Yeah, we'll see. Go on. Go on there. Uh, wait. That house. Where's that, sir? On this side, just before the bend. Oh, that. Only an old ruin. Of a very grand house. It's certainly the largest I've seen in the past few days. About a hundred yards from the town of Vendôme, on the borders of the Loire, there is an old grey house surmounted by very high gables and so completely isolated that neither inn nor other hostelry, such as you may find at the entrance to all small towns, exists in its immediate neighborhood. Get up now. No, no, wait. Strange. A perfect spot. Gardens down to the river, the woods opposite. And now, utterly neglected. What happened, Jean? How do you mean, sir? Well, I mean, was it just abandoned? Couldn't say. Well, I'd say it was certainly worth a closer look. Bit late, isn't it, sir? Perhaps we ought to be getting back. Nonsense. I doubt if Madame Fayaz even started cooking. Even if she has, well, I'm curious. And I intend to satisfy my curiosity. Shall we go? Move on. Can't you see how I'm having to struggle here? Oh, your assistant, Jean, would be greatly appreciated. Very good, sir. Oh, it's completely seized up with rust. You have to lift. That's it. Bit more. There. there. Good God. What a terrible waste. In front of this building, overlooking the river, is a garden. 
where the once well-trimmed box borders that used to define the walks now grow wild as they list. The rich vegetation of those weeds that we call foul adorns the sloping shore. Fruit trees, neglected for many years, no longer yield their harvest, and their shoots form coppices. Paths once gravelled are overgrown with moss, but to tell the truth, there is no trace of a path. This must have been so peaceful, but now well, it's almost inconceivable. I, I mean that someone could have allowed... How, how long has it been like this? I don't know, sir. Oh, won't say. Twenty years or more. Nearer thirty, perhaps. And who owned this house? Hmm? Huh? Who lived here? Never had dealings oh, with them. For heaven's sir. sake, man, you've lived in Vendôme all your life. The house was never part of the town, being set out here by the river. Well, whoever owned it must have had money. And a taste for the provincial life. Oh, the arbour over there. Or oh, what's left of it. Beautiful piece of work. Well, it's not the sort you'd expect to find outside the capital. Enormous cracks furrow the walls round whose blackened crests twine a thousand garlands of rampant finery. The steps are out of joint. The wire of the bell is rusted. The spouts are cracked. What fire from heaven has fallen here? What tribunal has decreed that salt should be strewn on this dwelling? The empty and deserted house is a gigantic enigma of which the key is lost. Unbelievable that anyone could just abandon all this. Uh, and yet, it is as if something still watches over this place. Something is watching this insolent stranger who dares to violate the sanctity of its secret. The roof of this house is horribly dilapidated. The shutters are always closed. The balconies are covered with swallows' nests. The doors are perpetually shut. Weeds have drawn green lines in the cracks of the flights of steps. The locks and bolts are rusty. Oh, it, it's going to take more than just a few overgrown vines to keep me from finding out. Oh, God. Oh. Oh, God. Oh. Jean. Jean. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> oh. Jean, uh, I, uh, I thought you'd gone. No, sir. Good. Good, because I, I want to try and open these shutters. I don't doubt one of them will come away. You mean to go in, then? As I said, I'm a curious man, and as you won't give me any information, perhaps I'll look for the answer inside. Grand Bretèche. What's that? The house. It was called the Grand Bretèche. <gasps> Am I to understand that you would prefer me not to go inside? Hmm? For example, who allowed this once? beautiful house to become this, 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 this rotting carcass. There was tragedy in that house. Go on. Three people died. What happened? I know nothing else. I think you do. What are you trying to hide, John? I know nothing else, I tell you, nothing. We must go now. Please, do as I say. Very well, my friend. We will go now. Oh. And we will go as quickly as possible. I do not doubt there are others in Vendôme less reluctant to tell me what happened here at the Grand Bretèche. <sighs> ah, welcome back, monsieur. You've had a pleasant day. Thank you, Monsieur Fayard. Very pleasant. Well, you certainly brought the good weather with you, though I don't think it'll last much longer. Well, a place by your fire will more than compensate. 
Oh, here, let me help you oh, with no, those. No, 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 I can manage. <laughs> I'm not so old that I can't lift a few logs. Oh. Besides, you're a guest. No, you sit yourself down. I've set the jug there for you. Oh, thank you. So, uh, where did Jean take you today, then? We came back along the river. Uh, past the Grand Bretache. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Well, you, you know it, of course. Uh, yes, I know it. It seems a pity to have let such a magnificent house get into such a, a state of disrepair. Uh, a pity indeed, monsieur. How long has it been like that? Who knows? It's been a long time since I walked that way. Mm -hmm. How long? <laughs> Monsieur, I have trouble trying to remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> Never mind so many years ago. Please try. Uh, Monsieur, I, uh, you must not ask me things. But then you do know something. I know nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, there's nothing I can tell you. Oh, haven't you finished in here yet? Come on upstairs with you. There's a fire to be lit in the Monsieur's room. Or do I have to do everything around here single-handed? I tell you, monsieur, if ever a woman was cursed with an idle, good-for-nothing layabout of a husband... Oh, Madame Fayard, only yesterday you were telling me what a paragon he was. That was yesterday. I came to tell you that your supper can be served whenever you want. Um, is it something that will keep for a while? Well, yes, I suppose so. Soup, cassoulet, yes, there's no problem. The monsieur's not hungry, then? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, but not so hungry that I would not prefer sharing a glass with you first. Oh, monsieur, I'm not sure that I've got the time oh, to no, sit no, Of course you have, madame. Am I not your only guest? Well, perhaps for a few minutes. There. Your health, madame. And yours, monsieur. Mm. Oh, that's good. No, oh, not as good as the fine wines you were used to drinking, I suppose. Oh, better. It is a wine of the country. It's an honest wine. I'm content it should please you, monsieur. Madame Fayard, I'm curious about one of the houses you have here in Vendôme. Monsieur? Well, not quite in the town, perhaps, but close by, near the river, in fact. It's called the Grand Bretèche. What's that fool of a husband of mine been saying to you? <laughs> Nothing. Which is why I'm asking you. Well? Is the monsieur ready for his supper now? If there is some sort of mystery about the house, I should very much like to know what it is. Then you must ask another. I already have, which is why I know that there is a mystery. I must ask you again, monsieur. Are you ready for your supper now? Oh, Madame Fayard, I fear I must leave Vendôme tomorrow. But, monsieur, I... Th Thought, well, you said you'd be here for another week at least. Oh, that was my intention. But why? I'm a writer, madame. If I do not find my story in one place, I must move on to another. But, monsieur, I'm sure if you stay here for just a few more days, you will find your story. In my experience, there's really more than one good story to be found in any one place. I thought I'd found that one story. You mean you would write about the Grand Bretèche? Possibly. And if you did, you would want to stay with us for a few more days. Perhaps even a week. Probably. We are poor people, monsieur. <laughs> to have a fine gentleman <clears throat> such as yourself staying here, well, that's the only means we have of making a living. I understand, madame. So, what is it you want to know? I want to know what happened at the Grand Bretèche. Jean told me there was a tragedy connected with the house. A tragedy in which three people died. Who were they? Two men, a Spaniard and a Frenchman, and one woman, the wife of the Frenchman. The Spaniard, he died because he was an honourable man. The wife, because she was an honourable woman. And the other man? Ah, the husband. He died because he felt so guilty about his dishonour that he drank himself to death. When, when did all this happen? Oh, monsieur, your questions are impossible. 1810, perhaps? 11 or 12? I'm not sure. A good 30 years ago, that's all I know. Oh, Bonaparte was fighting in Spain, then. Oh, the Spaniard, he... He was a prisoner of war. Oh, well, certainly. Here in Vendôme? Naturally, when they first told me what was going to happen, well, I was worried about having a prisoner under my roof. All the stories you hear... But when the gendarme brought him to the door, well, I knew he wasn't the sort to cause any trouble. Well, down you get, then. 
That's it. Now, just stay there. Madame Fire! Are you there? It's making all that... Oh, it's you, Henri. Is this the fellow you were telling me about? That's right, madame. Madame, is it? It was Paulette when you were here the other evening. <sighs> this is official business. I'll remember that. Paulette? I'm on duty. And I haven't got all day. Let's take a look at him. Hmm. Doesn't look much like a prisoner. Does he speak French? Couldn't tell you. Some of them do, after a fashion. But him, he's a real quiet one. Can't say I've heard him say anything in any language since they handed him over. Has he got a name? If you can pronounce it. Let's see now. Jaime Felipe Borgos de Fey... Fey Ray Dr. I think you'd better call him whatever takes your fancy, eh? Hey? For radio <laughs> will do. Oh, as you like. So, that's my part done. I'll leave him with you there, Madame Fay. Paulette. Yes, off you go. I'll take care of him. Very well. Prisoner, don't forget now, you must show yourself to the sous-prefet every day. Is that understood? Eh? There, you see, not a word. And yet, the way he looks at you sometimes, as if he's understood everything that's been said. <laughs> Still, if I was that far from home, I don't suppose I'd be saying much either. Good day to you then. Let's take a look at you then. Hmm, not such a bad looking fellow, are you? No, I don't think you're going to give me any trouble. Although, <laughs> and as for not having much to say for yourself, well, I dare say you'll open your mouth as and when it suits you. So, let's get you off to your room, then. I hope you're not expecting anything too grand. This Spaniard, fair idea, did he give you any trouble? Well, not for one moment, monsieur. Not me, not the super fair, not anyone. He kept his parole like the perfect gentleman I'm sure he was. Hmm. Well, tell me about him. I mean... Can you remember the way he looked? Oh, but he was a handsome young man for a Spaniard. <laughs> You've seen others, then? Well, no, but they're all said to be ugly, aren't they? But this one, oh, he was only five feet and a few inches high, but very well grown. Thick black hair, a fiery eye. His skin rather bronzed, but I liked the look of it. He didn't eat much, but his manners were so polite, so amiable, that one couldn't owe him a grudge. And on the wall in his room, he'd hung a crucifix of ebony and silver. The most beautiful I have ever seen. Oh, I was very fond of him. Although he hardly spoke a word from one day's end to the next. Well, apart from his daily visit to the office of the sous-prefet, did he go anywhere else in town? Oh, only to mass. But that's as regular as clockwork. And where did he sit? Why, just a few steps from the chapel of Madame de Merey. Oh. Madame de Merret? The lady of the house. The lady from the Grand Bretèche. Ah, please, now go on. Thank you. It was so long ago. Uh, uh, something must have happened. Of course, but... No, no, it's gone. Oh, the, the church, was it there? No, I don't think so. Well, at the house, then, at the Grand Bretèche. Perhaps, yes, perhaps it was there. Oh, now I remember... Yes, it was odd. Here, in this house... Well, what happened? Well, when I say he never went out but to go to the church and to visit the superfair, of course, I was forgetting about the evenings. Hardly surprising. I had so many guests to fuss over in those days. Well, where did he go? Who knows where he walked? In the hills, among the castle ruins, along by the river. Hour after hour. Poor man, it was his only amusement. And always, from the very start... Always he stayed out late. Well, at first I was anxious. I mean, here was a prisoner staying in my house who never came back before midnight. But then, after a few weeks, I suppose we became accustomed to this fancy of his. Besides, he had the key of the door, and after a while, well, we just left off sitting up for him. <laughs> so you more or less let him come and go as he pleased? Why not? He was doing no harm. But then, one evening... The stable boy told me something that made me think that perhaps all was not quite as it seemed. So the very next morning, when I took fresh water to his room, I thought I'd hear what the Spaniard had to say for himself. Morning, monsieur. Beautiful day. Though I don't suppose you've seen much of it. Let's get some light in here, shall we? That's better. Come on, sleepyhead. It's past midday, you know. I think I'm going to have to pull the bedclothes off you. 
Well, that made you move quickly enough. Can't think why. I've seen more than enough of men lying in their beds, I can tell you. So you're in one of your silent moods again, are you? Suit yourself. Time you were up and about, though. Can't spend your life lazing round here all day. Oh, my stable lad says he saw you the other evening. Yes, said you were swimming in the river. He was quite sure of it. There was no one else there. Only, well, I just wanted to say, you should be careful, that's all. Not just because you're a prisoner, mind. No, it's just that there's a strong current up by the Grand Bretèche. Don't suppose any of us would want to see you drowned. Least of all me. Uh, if you want your food, you'd better come straight down. I've got enough to do today without having to wait for the likes of you. There can be no doubt that the person your stable lad saw in the river was the Spaniard. None whatsoever. If anyone from Vendôme wanted to go swimming, then they'd go to the other side of the town. The river's slower there, slower and safer. No, there can be no doubt. It was the Spaniard. You, you, you seem to attach a great deal of importance to this, madame. So he was swimming. Well, a most excellent exercise. And for a prisoner with little to do all day, yes, why... Well, yes, monsieur, I understand. <laughs> And perhaps I would have felt the same way as you, except that within just one week of this, just one week, he had gone. Huh? What do you mean, escaped? Perhaps, perhaps not. All I know is that when I went to his room that morning, he was not there. Nor had he been there at all during the night that had just passed. Naturally, I called my husband at once. There, you see? His bed hasn't been slept in, the shutters are open, and his clothes aren't there. Well, perhaps, perhaps he walked too far last night, and then he decided to sleep wherever he happened to be. Not in the open at this time of year. Not even you would have done that. Not even when we were first married. Then he must have been put up for the night. Someone must have taken him in. Where? There's no one who'd open their door after dark this side of the train, I can tell you. And he'd never have walked as far as there. No, he's gone, I tell you. Would he have taken his crucifix if he'd meant to come back? How do you mean? It's gone, that's what I mean. Look, there on the wall, that's where it used to hang. That crucifix was precious to him. <laughs> not so precious that he won't try and sell it between here and Spain. Oh, no, not that one. Oh, well, I suppose I'd better go and see the sous-préfet. Just hope we don't get the blame for all this. Why should we? We were told he could come and go as he pleased. What worries me is they might decide not to pay us for his quarter this past month. Oh, I don't see how they can do that. Well, they can do what they like, and they will, you'll see. But I don't see why we should be the losers on their account. What are you doing now, woman? There must be something we can sell. Most of them leave something behind. Well, it doesn't seem right. Nor does holding back our money. Now stop your whining and give me a hand. Try those drawers in the table there. It still doesn't make this right. A man's still entitled to his privacy, no matter... What is it? Have you found something? I think that is, I think... Let me see, let me see. Oh, that sounds promising. Oh, yes! It must be Spanish coin. There must be... Oh, I don't know how oh, much. have to pay for his keep for two years or more. Then surely, I mean, he can't have forgotten about all this. He must be coming back. What's that paper? Huh? Where? In the drawer there. He must have left that too. Ah... It must be some sort of letter. Give it here. Well? It is a letter. A letter for us. Dear Monsieur and Madame Fayard, in case I do not return, I am leaving this to pay for masses to thank God for my escape and for my salvation. Then he has gone. What should we do? You do nothing but exactly what I tell you. We must be sure that he really has gone. So, husband, you must take the horse and search everywhere for him, and look especially well near the river where he was seen to be swimming, the bank opposite the Grand Bretèche. I have a feeling that might well be the direction he took. And of course I was right, for when my husband returned, he brought back the Spaniard's clothes. And where did he find them? Near the river. Opposite the Grand Bretèche. Exactly. All laid out neatly under a pile of stones, and not another living soul in sight. Well, what did you do with them? We burned them, every last stitch. We told the gendarme he'd disappeared, of course, and later that day he came round to tell us how the search for the escaped prisoner had gone. So there was no sign of him? Uh, nothing at all. Six of us out there all day and not a trace. 
If you ask me, he's either drowned himself or he's halfway back to Spain by now. And what's it matter? One less mouth for the Emperor to feed, that's what I say. <sighs> Did you hear about the Turk girl? Rosalie? She's gone. Gone where? Left early this morning, so they say, with her fiancé. Von Dome wasn't good enough for them, eh? Or for the child, some say she carries. Oh, so that's the way of things, is it? Pooh, as if you wouldn't have been among the first to know. And what did you believe, madame? Did you think the Spaniard had drowned himself? I did, at first. But after I heard what Rosalie had to say, flighty little thing she was... She came back to Vendôme, then? Oh, yes. Anyone could have seen it was never going to last. Rosalie? Who was she? Maid to Madame de Marais. And what did she tell you? That she knew he didn't drown. It was his crucifix, you see. <sighs> His crucifix. Tell me. Rosalie said that her mistress, that Madame de Marais, thought so much of that crucifix that she had it buried with her. Suddenly, the Grande Bretèche and its tall weeds, its barred windows, its rusty ironwork, its closed doors, its deserted apartments, appeared like a fantastic apparition before me. I essayed to penetrate the mysterious dwelling and to find the knot of its dark story. The drama that had killed three persons. Now, I dare say there may well be more than one crucifix of ebony and silver in this world. All I know is that when we found the Spaniard had gone from his room, he'd taken that crucifix with him. Well, surely you've tried to question Rosalie. Well, of course I have. But she's like a wall, that girl. She knows something, all right. But get her to talk... You'd have more chance with a mule. She's still here in Vendôme, then? Where else would she go? Where will I find her? Works in the inn, on the Viltrain Road. Thank you, madame. Am I to understand that the monsieur will be staying on for a few more days now? Madame Fayard, I think you understand that very well. Now I was prey to a romantic curiosity to a religious terror not unlike the profound impression produced on us when, by night, on entering a dark church, we perceive a faint light under high arches. Then a vague figure glides by. The rustle of a robe or cassock is heard, and we shudder. Rosalie. Monsieur? Can you sit with me for a while? As I studied her, I discovered the traces of a secret care. There was in her the germ of remorse or hope. Her attitude revealed a secret, like the attitude of a bigot who prays to excess, or of the infanticide who ever hears the last cry of her child. And yet her manners were rough and ingenuous. Her silly smile was not that of a criminal. And could you have but seen the great kerchief that encompassed her portly bust, framed and laced in by a lilac and blue cotton gown, you would have dubbed her innocent. Now what would a fine gentleman like you be doing with the likes of me? Oh, a little conversation, perhaps. There's plenty here to be glad to talk to you, though I don't doubt you'd wish they hadn't by the time they're through. Rosalie! Come over here! I wanna... You wait your turn! Just because I'm here all day, they think I'm at their beck and call. Even when I'm in my room, they think they only have to snap their fingers and I'll come running up to serve them. Filthy lot! You're not married, then? Oh, I can find plenty of men when the fancy takes me to be made miserable. Oh, so that is what we are for. Those sort of men are not like you, monsieur. And yet you once had a fiancé. What do you want of me, monsieur? Just a few words. <laughs> to understand. Who's being talking about you? I'm staying at the house of Madame Fire. What else did she say? That you were once in the service of Madame de Merry. What if I was? Then I would ask you to tell me what you know about the tragedy of the Grand British. Well... Does the monsieur wish something else to drink? Uh, Rosalie. No? no? No, please. Then if you'll excuse me, I've got other customers waiting to be served. Uh, Rosalie. Rosalie appeared to me to be situated in this romantic history like the square at the centre of a chessboard. 
She was at the heart of the truth, and bound in the very knot of it. The winning of Rosalie was now no longer to be an ordinary siege, for in her lay the key to this mystery. Good morning, Rosalie. Oh, monsieur. I frightened you. I did not mean to. I didn't think anyone else... That is, I thought I was alone here. All alone, staring through the gates of the Grand Bretèche. How did you know I would be here? They told me at the inn that you were out walking. I thought it might be here. I ask you again, what do you want of me, monsieur? The truth. That may not be mine to give. If it belongs to the three who died in that house, then it is not yours to refuse. Besides, what use are their secrets to them now? Especially when they may help one as troubled as you. Please, leave me be. You cannot help me. But I can, Rosalie. And I will. If you will let me. Now tell me, why did you leave Vendôme all those years ago? I, to be with my lover. They say you may have been with child. Was that so? Yes. Where's that child now? It died. It, it only lived for three days. And your lover? When the child... after... he no longer cared to be my lover. And so you came back to Vendôme? There was nowhere else to go. Of course there was nowhere else. For it's here, here at the Grand Bretèche. This is where your secret lies. No, it was my child. My baby. My poor baby. Help me, monsieur. Please help. Please. Oh, yes, Rosalie. Of course I will help you. But I can only do that if you tell me the truth. Monsieur? Uh, there was another reason why you left, wasn't there? No. But I know that there was. And it has to do with something that happened in there, in that very house. No, it's That's not That's why true. you came here today. Because something took place in that house that has caused you so much distress. Is that not so? I... Uh, yes. And now the time has come to face the truth. To free yourself from the fear, the, the secret of the past. Yes. Yes. But now but I'm you, here. You, you I... don't have to face it alone, Rosalie. We will go into the house together. But, Monsieur. I... Now I'm here to help you, Rosalie. Now come. Please. We shouldn't be here. Someone might come. It's all we right. must leave. It's all Please, right. It's all right. It's all right. I'm here. Please. Now you've come this far. You must not turn back now. Where, Rosalie? Where did it happen? No. Now tell me. Was it here, here in the hall? No. Would the kitchen? The salon? Uh, no. Would upstairs? Was it upstairs? Yes. Yes. Then that is where we must go. No, Monsieur, please. Come you on. must not take me there, please. There please. There was a tragedy here. Rosalie, what happened? Oh, no, Monsieur, please. Uh, three people died here. Oh, please, it was so long Monsieur ago. Monsieur de Merret. Yes. Madame de Merret. Yes. Oh, madame, madame, poor madame. She oh. wanted a child so much, way, so very Rosalie? much. Which way? Oh, madame, poor madame. To the left? I don't, I can't. No. no. To the right then. Which room, Rosalie? Which room? Was it this one? No. Was this one? No, no, please, you must stop. No, 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 not now, not now. This one? No. Is this one? So, we are here. Rosalie, come into the room. Come on, that's it. Now another step, and another. There. Now you tell me, what do you see? I see, I see Madame's room. What else? I see the wall. Yeah, the wall? The wall? The wall? No, what, no. what is it about the wall? No. The wall? What do you see? Rosalie. Rosalie, tell me about the wall! No! No!
Monsieur? I'm here. You must please forgive me, Monsieur. Well, there's nothing to forgive. You're safe now. What must I do? You must tell me all you know. I... May I take your hand? Of course. Do you wish to tell me about it? I think so. I think so, too. Now tell me, Rosalie. What happened at the Grand Bretesh? What happened in that room? Yes. It has been so long. It will be good to talk to you, Monsieur. To tell you what happened in that room. I... Madame de Meret, I had been in her service for about a year when, on the night that it happened, the master had gone out to his club in the evening. Madame was in her apartment and she had told me she would not need my services. So for most of the evening I just sat in the kitchen talking to Jean, the master's coachman. Mm. Pretty quiet up there, isn't it? I don't know what you mean. Oh... Little Miss Innocent, Master's out, Mistress has told you to keep out of the way, and it's all gone very quiet. Now, what are we supposed to make of that? Cut us a bit of that bread. Mistress's business is none of yours. Master's soon make it is if he knew about it. Well, he's not going to, is he? We'll see. Mind you, can't say as I blame her. I mean, they're not exactly what you'd call a loving couple, are they? They get on all right. Then why's the missus got her own apartment, eh? You tell me that. It's just... well... I don't know. Some husbands and wives find it better. Oh, I don't know. I don't suppose you do. But if you ask me, it'd be a lot better. What was that? Well, it's only a door closing. But who? Master, I expect. But he never comes home this early, not when he's gone to the club. His house. He can do what he likes. No, he mustn't. Not your place to tell the master what he... Oh, huh. I see what you mean. Jean, we must do something. Should have thought of that sooner. Or she should. Don't worry. He'll go straight to his room. Always does. But what if he doesn't? I wouldn't go interfering if I were you. Let him sort out their own affairs. I can't just sit here. I must go to her. Just as Rosalie had feared, de Mary did not go directly to his room, but made his way towards his wife's apartment, which lay at the back of the house. At the very moment that he turned the handle of his wife's door, de Mere thought he heard the door of the closet within being shut. But as he found Madame de Mere alone, the husband ingenuously thought that it must have been Rosalie who had gone into the closet to prepare her mistress's gown for the following day. Yet a suspicion that jangled in his ear put him on his guard. He looked at his wife and saw in her eyes, I know not, what wild and hunted expression. Are you unwell, madame? Why do you ask? It is unusual for you to retire at this hour. I... I was feeling a little indisposed earlier. I am quite well now. Come. Rosalie. Yes, sir. Rosalie. I thought you might need me, madame. Go and wait in the kitchen. My wife will send for you when she is ready. Very good, sir. Madame, there is someone in your closet. No, sir. You are mistaken. Very well. We shall see. Wait! If you find no one there, remember this. All will be over between us. So be it. I will not go there. For in either case it would separate us forever. But hear me, and listen carefully, as befits one who is holy and pure at heart. As one who would profess not to commit a mortal sin even to save her life. Take up your crucifix. Take it up. Now, swear to me before God, that there is no one in there. <gasps> Swear that to me, and I will believe you, and I will never open that door. I swear. 
louder. And repeat, I swear before God that there is no one in that closet. I swear before God there is no one in that closet. Very well. Jean, Rosalie. That crucifix of yours, my dear, give it to me. Thank you. Yes, a very pretty toy. Beautifully worked. And expensive, I don't doubt. But you know, my dear, I can't for the life of me remember seeing it before. I found it at Duvivier's just the other day. He, he bought it from a Spanish monk when those prisoners passed through Vendôme last year. Really? How very interesting. Wait there, Jean. Rosalie, come here. It's all right. No harm is going to come to you. Yes, sir. Your fiancé, Gorenflo, he is a mason, is he not? Yes, sir. But an impoverished one. And although he wishes to marry you, am I right in saying that you will only be his wife when he finds the means to establish himself as a master of his trade? Yes, that's what I told him, sir. Then you will be pleased to hear those means are now at hand. Listen carefully. Go to Gorenflo and tell him to come here immediately and to bring his mason's tools. Go straight to his house and do not speak to another soul. But what shall I tell him? You will tell him only that his fortune will be more than your desires. Go quickly now. Jean. Sir? You will instruct all the other servants to go to their beds. And you will go to the coach house and bring sufficient bricks and plaster to wall up the door to the closet over there. <gasps> Do you understand? Uh, yes, sir. Do it quickly, then. Very good, sir. My dear, is there something wrong? I... I am perfectly well. But you look so pale. Perhaps you are still troubled by the indisposition you mentioned. I think... Perhaps I am feeling a little faint. If only you had said. Had I known, I would never have left you alone this evening. Come now, let me help you to your bed. No. Please. It will pass. Only if you do as I say. There. Just lie down now. That's it. Now, what is all this about? Do you wish me to send for the doctor? No. It is nothing, really. Fainting for no apparent reason can hardly be dismissed as nothing. I just need to rest. Leave me now, and tomorrow I will be quite well again. Leave you? Oh, no, my dear. How could I leave you when you're in such distress? You are making too much of this, sir. I must insist that you leave me to rest. And I must insist that I stay here in your room until I'm perfectly satisfied that you are well again. But I... No, not another word. I am staying. Let that be the end of the matter. You'll never guess who I met at the club this evening? Maitre Clouvel. Quite remarkable for his age. What would he be now, 73? Four? And if it hadn't been for the billiards match, I think I might have come home even earlier than I did. I only wish I had. It really is so distressing for me to find you like this, my dear. Perhaps when you're quite well again, we might think of a... Ah, at last. Rosalie, come and sit here by your mistress. Regrettably, she is feeling somewhat distraught. Yes, sir. Now, got on flow. You see here sufficient of the materials of your trade to brick up the closet there? Do you agree? You mean across the doors? I mean that when you have finished, I no longer wish to see a closet built into the thickness of the wall. I wish to see nothing but one solid wall. Have I made myself clear? Yes, sir. Very well. Come over here to the window. When you've finished your work, you will pass the rest of the night here in this house. Tomorrow, you and Rosalie will have passports to a country to which I will direct you, where you will stay for ten years. You will have six thousand francs to take with you, and I guarantee another six when you have fulfilled our bargain at the end of the allotted time. 
This is the price for your absolute silence as to what you're about to do tonight. Have you understood everything I've said? I, I have, sir. And you agree to my conditions? Well, yes, sir, I do. Good. And start your work. Could you not go a little faster, God and Flow? Begging your pardon, sir, but it would be a lot easier if I could take these doors off. No, the doors must stay as they are. <laughs> yes, sir, but if you want me the to... The doors will stay. Very good, sir. Rosalie, madame, Rosalie, I need your help. There is nothing I can do, madame. Yes, there is. <clears throat> you must give your fiancé a message. But how can I? Your husband, Monsieur de Merret. I will find a way. Will you help me? I'd like to, madame, but, well, a thousand francs. I will give you a thousand francs if you will tell Goronflo to break one of the glass panes in the door and then leave a gap between two of the bricks. But your husband, he's watching all the time. It can be done. You must try. Please, Rosalie, please. All right. I'll try. Excuse me, sir. Well? Well, I've been thinking, sir, and I know the work would go a lot faster if you could get your coachman to give me a hand, sir. No. You'll just have to do the best you can. Very good, sir. Rosalie could help. You would be willing to help, would you not? Of course, madame. There. You see? Go on, Flo. That'd suit me fine, sir. Very well. Thank you, sir. Right then, Rosalie. I think the best way of working is for you to bring those bricks a bit closer and then hand them to me when I say. That's it. You should see quite a difference now, sir. Let us hope so. Let's have another one there. That's it. And another. What have you done? Uh, it's all right, sir. My trowel slipped. Broke some glass in the door. No harm done. I mean, it's all been covered up anyway, isn't it? Get on with your work. Very good, sir. Nearly done, sir. Just have to smooth off the plaster a bit more. Leave it. But, Monsieur de Marais, a few more minutes. I must finish my work. I said leave it. The wall is perfectly solid. Your work is finished. Very good, sir. Go downstairs now and wait in the kitchen. I suspect there may still be a fire to sit by. By the morning I will have prepared a banker's draft in your name. Jean will take you and Rosalie to Viltrin, and from there you will take the coach to Blois. You will not go into Vendôme. You will not speak to a living soul of what has happened here this night. Do I make myself clear? You do, sir. Very well. You may go. Well, madame, what do you think? I think you are a cruel man. Cruel? But surely... Oh, of course. Of course it is cruel to keep you from your sleep like this. How thoughtless of me. Here, let me turn down the lamp for you. There. Now that is better. Now you can sleep. What are you doing? Forgive me, my dear. There will be no more noise. But the chair, what are you doing? But my dear, surely you don't expect me to pass the rest of the night lying on the floor? You mean to stay here, then? And where else should I be when my dear wife is unwell? Oh. It is my duty to watch over you. And be assured, my dear, I will watch over you. I will watch over you very carefully indeed. Wake up now, both of you. It's a beautiful day. Far too beautiful to be still lying abed. Rosalie, come now, wake up. What time is it, sir? Well past eight o'clock. Come now, there's much to be done. And you, madame? I trust you slept well. I did not sleep. No, I doubt that you did. Such a pity, for sleep is what you need, my dear. And sleep is what you shall now have, for I have to go into Vendôme at once. And as I shall be away for at least an hour or so, 
You'll be able to rest undisturbed by my fussing over you. Rosalie, you will stay with your mistress until she is asleep. Yes, sir. Oh, madame, do you Shh. think... He's gone. Quickly now. What are you doing? Help me, Rosalie. Oh, madame? It's here somewhere. Oh, it all looks the same. Where? Where? Please, you must calm yourself. You saw it, Rosalie. You saw where he left the gas. Yes, but this master... The trowel. Quickly, give it to me. But what did your husband... Give it to me. We have time, Rosalie. Time to make a hole and mend it again. Yes, here. No. Here, perhaps. Oh, here. Yes, it must be here. A little further to the left, perhaps. <gasps> Help your mistress to her bed, Rosalie. Yes, sir. There now. Right, madame. I look after you. That's it. Can you hear me, madame? Yes. Good. For I brought someone to see you. Would you come in now, de Vivier? Thank you, Monsieur de Mary. My wife is a trifle indisposed just now, but this will not take long. My dear, this is Monsieur de Vivier, the jeweller from Vendôme. But of course you already know that. De Vivier? Do you remember when those Spaniards passed through the town last year? Very well, sir. In fact, I closed my shop so that my wife and I yes, could... Yes, yeah. yes. Do you remember a Spanish monk in particular? A monk? Well, now, let me see. A monk? No, no, I don't recall. Well, then, let us try a different route. As a jeweller, no doubt you sell items of a religious nature. Yes, sir, I do. And would that include a selection of crucifixes? A very small selection, Monsieur de Mary. That is not to say there is no great call for them, indeed, no. But as I am sure you are aware, the items I deal in usually cost more than the majority of citizens of Vendôme wish to pay. I understand. So if I told you that the particular crucifix to which I refer was made of ebony and silver, you would no doubt remember it? I would indeed, sir. Has such a crucifix passed through your hands in the last year? Not in the last five. Perhaps even longer than that. As I've said, I only have a small selection, and I would most certainly have remembered the one to which you refer. I believe you are the only jeweller in Vendôme? I have that honour, sir. I trust that will so continue. Thank you, de Vivier. That will be all. Oh. Well, well yes. Uh, th thank you, Monsieur de Mary. Good day to you, sir. Good day, madame. You may go too, Rosalie. But, madame, sir, she really is unwell. Thank you for your concern, Rosalie. I will be here to care for her. Very good, sir. And, Rosalie, when you see Jean, tell him that when he returns from Viltran, he is to see that my meals are served here, in my wife's room. As you have said, she is ill, and I shall not leave her until she has recovered. Yes, sir. Well, madame... Do you have anything to tell me now? No. No. As you please. Well then, perhaps we'd better devise some ways in which to pass the time we're about to spend together. You know, my dear, you really should try and eat. This fish is delicious. What's it been now? Three days? Or is it four? Strange how one loses all count of time in these situations. Still, I'll just go on waiting and hoping. Tomorrow, perhaps. Perhaps you'll eat then. How still it is out there. As if something were about to happen. But yesterday's storms have gone. Jean tells me the river is running quite full. But at least you have tried something today, my dear. The first time in nearly a week. Why, at this rate, you'll be well again quite soon. Please. Please. My dear, there is something you want? Tell me, and I will fetch it for you. Oh, you've changed your mind. As you wish. And if you decide to change it again, I shall be here. I shall not go away. Sixteen days. Sixteen days you've lain here, my dear. And no sign that you are recovering. I really am most concerned about you. Most concerned. 
I would have sent for the doctor long before now, but I doubt if there would be anything he could do for you. You see, I am convinced it is your mind that is troubled. Your mind, not your body. So, here I sit and wait and hope. I... Please. My dear, is there something you want? Please tell me. I... Oh, for pity's sake. Pity? For what? I, I do not understand, my dear. Tell me again. Please, try. No? Ah. Oh, are you referring to the matter of the closet? Is that it? No, of course not. That could hardly be the case. No, not the closet. For you have sworn on the crucifix that there is no one there. In The Mysterious Mansion by Honoré de Balzac, dramatized for radio by Peter Mackey, Balzac was played by David Calder, Jean by Dorian Thomas, and Monsieur Fayard by Dilwyn Owen. Madame Fayard by Tessa Gearing, Jean d'Arme and Gorenflo by Christopher Grimes, and Rosalie by Marilyn Leconte. Monsieur de Meret by Nigel Carrington, Madame de Meret by Manon Edwards, and Duvivier by Alan Towner. The Mysterious Mansion was directed in Wales by David Hunter. <laughs>